Young people, please hear me. This to me is the problem of man. He no longer knows what to laugh at and no longer knows what to weep at. So you turn on your television screen and before you know it, you're looking at a seduction yourself and instead of weeping at it, you're watching an intrigue as the story unfolds. You watch illegitimacies transpire before your eyes and mine and because Hollywood has convinced us that it is entertainment, we become entertained rather than sitting there with a crushed and a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And I often wonder if my Lord Jesus were able to stalk some of the seats of Broadway or sit in some of the theaters where things are perpetrated and shown to you and me, where jokes are made of his virgin birth, where Christianity is demeaned and mocked, where illegitimacies are glorified and exalted, that which is vulgar is intended to make us laugh, that which is sacred is intended to make us weep, rather than sit there in awe and gratitude for the sacred, what has really happened between the educational system and whatever else is happening, we've lost the differentiation between laughter and tears. It is vitally important what you laugh at, it is vitally important what you weep at. What breaks your heart tells God who you are. What makes you laugh tells God who you are. In the New Testament, which actually harks back to Deuteronomy chapter 8, and it is what we call familiarly the tempting, or I think the better term would be the testing of Jesus Christ. He's just gone through his baptism. He's just been declared and affirmed and all that is affirmed from the heavens itself, this is my son, I love him, with him I am well pleased. That is the testimony of the father. As soon as that testimonial is given and that ceremonial moment is finished, he is driven by the spirit into the wilderness to be tested. So prior to his preaching and his baptism, is this parenthetical test that is one of the most extraordinary passages of Holy Writ. I think this is one of the most powerful passages because really when you think about it, there is no eyewitness to this episode. It's the Lord Jesus alone in the wilderness being tested. And so he had to have narrated this story to the disciples and ultimately to the those who wrote down the scriptures for us because something of enormous importance is going on here and for those of us who love the word I think this passage is remarkable because it teaches us how to put every text into a context there's a larger context to do everything rather than just proof texting on any particular matter may I read this for you from Matthew chapter 4 then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Those in the wilderness wandered for 40 years. They were tested in the same way. Our Lord goes through these 40 days and 40 nights. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, because now he's going to quote the scripture to him, not just assume it. He says this, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Then Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Imagine the audacity of this, that the enemy of our souls is looking at the Lord of the universe and saying to him, I'll give you all of these things if you'll only bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, 
and the angels came and attended him. And one of the gospel writers adds that caveat, he left him for a season. I think that was an important point one of the gospel writers made. W.E.H. Lecky, who was a great historian, but a skeptic himself, in his book entitled A History of European Morals from Augustus to Charlemagne, makes this comment about Jesus. The character of Jesus has not only been the highest pattern of virtue, but the strongest incentive in its practice and has exerted so deep an influence that it may be truly said that the simple record of three short years of active life has done more to regenerate and soften mankind than all the disquisitions of philosophers and all the exhortations of moralists. Here is a historian who's a skeptic saying the character of Jesus has not just been the highest pattern of virtue, but also the strongest incentive for people like you and me. The famed New Testament scholar F.F. F. Bruce responding to Leckie's comment made this statement, that is a non-Christian or at least not distinctly Christian judgment of one sense in which Jesus is not only a historical figure but also our eternal contemporary. His influence lives on. Not merely a historic figure but our eternal contemporary. That contemporaneity is what I want to talk about in how it is our Lord really wishes us to handle the temptations that we face just as he handled the testing in the wilderness. The first temptation came to him through the intellect. It's very subtle, this temptation. What does it really say? Why don't you turn these stones into bread? Because if you do that, the world will follow you. The miraculous power of delivering all that the body craves and desires in terms of food. The miraculous demonstration of taking stones and turning them into bread. Why don't you do that? And the whole world will follow you. The intellectual resistance to his claims. During my days of graduate studies, I, I remember one of my professors talking about this story. He talked about this man who woke up one morning and told his wife that he thought he was dead. And his wife thought, I know the man's got some weird predisposition, but this is really strange. She just ignored him. But day after day after day, he woke up and would claim that he was really not alive. He was really dead. So his wife said, why don't you just uh, go and see some doctors, you know? So she sent him to some psychiatrists, and the psychiatrists tried their best. He came back saying the same thing. Finally, she sent him to a team of medical doctors who sat down with their white coats, and they were trying to prove just one thing to him. Only living people bleed. Only living people bleed. Overhead charts, projectors, data, inundated him with all this information that only living people bleed. At which point he finally surrendered and said, all right, I guess I'm going to have to grant to you that only living people bleed. As soon as he said that, one of the doctors who kept a pin in his pocket, took the pin out, plunged it into this man's veins. The blood came spurting out. He looked at it and said, great Scott, I guess dead people bleed too. <laughs> there are some people for whom no amount of outward evidence is ever going to change their mind. I have said to some adversaries in our discussion, what would it take to convince you that he is the Son of God? And I think the terrifying expression that often comes on the face, it is not the evidence that they are looking for, but the fear of what the implications will be. Bertrand Russell was once asked, what will you say to God when you stand before him? What will you say in your defense? And Russell said, I will look at him and say, you did not give me enough evidence. My question to Mr. Russell would be, is it the absence of evidence or the suppression of it that you really are dealing with? When you think of the extraordinary depth of design intricacy within the human body. My professor of quantum theory at uh, Cambridge University, uh, one of the world's most renowned quantum physicists, John Pokinghorn, he was so remarkable in his knowledge. He's a latecomer to Christ. 
I remember one day him looking outside the window while half a dozen of his students were sitting here. He was looking out of the window. And he was talking to us. And he said, I want you to know the contingencies that had to be so exact in the early picoseconds of the formation of this world. So exact in the early picoseconds. I don't know if you know what a picosecond is. A picosecond is that amount of time which elapses when something traveling at the speed of light moves across one strand of a hair's breadth. How long would it take for something traveling at the speed of light to move across one strand of a, of, of a hair? That is a picosecond. Almost abstract. And he brings about just this one component of the expansion and contraction rate of the early universe in the picoseconds in which they had to record it. He said the exactitude demanded was so precise and the margin of error so small that, ladies and gentlemen, he said, it would be like taking aim at a one square inch object at the other end of the known universe 20 billion light years away and hitting it bullseye. Taking aim at a one square inch object at the other end of the known universe and hitting it bullseye. That's just one contingency demanded in the picosecond measurement of the formation of the early universe. You know what, Sir Fred? And then he paused and he said this in typical British understatement. He said, there's no free lunch. Somebody has to pay. Sir Frederick Hoyle and his Sri Lankan colleague Chandra Vikramasinghe, both of them mathematicians, well, one an astronomer from Cambridge, the other uh, a mathematician from Cardiff. When they did this study on the early origin of the universe, Vikramasinghe came out with a conclusion and Frederick Hoyle both said this, there is no way to explain the origin of life, and I'm quoting Hoyle now, in an earthbound explanation. Something extraterrestrial had to be brought into this plane, to this picture. And so Vikramasinghe went for what he called the panspermian theory. You know what the panspermian theory is? That spores from another planet or the clouds were brought to seed the earth. Sir Francis Crick, who won the Nobel Prize for cracking the code of the DNA, he said a, a spaceship from another planet brought the spores to seed the earth. That's how it got going. And they tell us we have faith. <laughs> Imagine that. Of course, nobody bothers to ask who made the spaceship. But it's okay. Some spaceship from somewhere. Now, I know I say this rather lightheartedly, but even Hoyle reacted to Vikram Singh and said, I don't know if I can go with that theory. Today, that theory is actually getting quite popular. Even Richard Dawkins said it is possible that the panspermian theory would hold the test of investigation someday. That's where they're going. Do you really think the problem is intellectual? He says, be gone. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You see, ladies and gentlemen, your problem and mine is not intellectual. It's actually moral slash spiritual. That's the bottom line of what really you and I struggle with. Yes, for many things, we do have a price. Maybe not for all things. But for many things, we do have a price. We can get seduced. We can get allured. And we cross lines and walk away after that. And the next morning, wake up and say, what on earth was I thinking? What on earth was I thinking? One of my most dramatic illustrations in this came years ago from one of my favorite authors, a man whom I considered it an extraordinary privilege to spend one afternoon with seven months before he passed away. I'm thinking of the man who I think was the greatest British journalist of the 20th century, Malcolm Muggeridge. Generally a toss-up between Muggeridge and Chesterton. Both of them late comers to Christ. And Muggeridge talks about the time he was serving as a journalist instructor in India. He loved India very much. In fact, when I visited him, he took me to one room where most of the pictures on the wall were from his days in India. He knew the leadership there, had fond memories. 
But in his book, The Green Stick, first volume of his autobiography called The Green Stick, A Chronicle of Wasted Years, quite a thick volume. He talks about the time he stepped out of his quarters in South India, went by a river and started to swim. Way out in the distance, he saw a woman disrobing and getting into the river, quite a distance away, but the silhouette of a body at sunrise, and he recognized it was a woman. So he decided to swim in her direction. He said, inside me, this conflict, don't, 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 but I kept swimming harder and harder till I arrived in the vicinity of her. And as I emerged from the waters and shook uh, the water away from my head, I was stunned to find out I was looking at a woman horribly stricken with leprosy. No fingers, no features, face so badly deformed, and he thought to himself, what a hideous looking person. And then he said, it dawned on me, it wasn't this woman who was hideous, but the hideousness of my own heart with which I was living all these years. And he got a glimpse of how wretched his own condition was. You know what, friend? Jesus is the only one to diagnose us with such precision of the wretchedness of the human heart. Take a look at where politics is taking us today. I have been on MH17 from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. I have flown that flight. And when I first heard the news that this was blown out of the sky, I said, what on earth? Do you remember when the Korean airliner was shot down? I remember the interaction between Vladimir Posner of Pravda and William Sapphire in a live exchange. And the Russians were trying to spin the story at that time that this was not really uh, what, uh, the, the, way, the way it was all seen. And they started to portray the story in the following manner that the lights of the plane on the inside were not turned on when the pilot was commanded to turn the lights on. So Sapphire and Posner are exchanging this conversation. And Sapphire says to him, how dare you say the lights weren't turned on? We know from the transcript the lights were turned on. It is your pilot who said that the, that the, that the, that the aircraft had its lights on. Posner brilliantly turned around. Here's what he said. No, 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 no. As you know, there were two fighter jets around this passenger plane. And when one, one pilot said in the transcript about the, uh, the light, he meant the other Russian pilot's lights were on. And he said that the, that's the lights he actually intended. Sapphire said, pardon me, can I read for you the script? It said, target's lights are on. Since when does one of your fighter pilots call, describe the other fighter pilot as a target, said he. You know the irony? Pravda means truth. This is what we live with. It's what we live with. I had the privilege uh, three weeks ago to be in Rio de Janeiro to see a couple of soccer matches. It's the first time I've seen it. I'm really a hockey fan here or a cricket fan back in India. I've never been to a soccer match. I never realized the intensity of the passion of being in a stadium with 76,000 people screaming over a ball of leather being kicked around from one end to the other and who'd, some of whom would be willing to die for their team to win. When Brazil lost, people were talking about committing suicide. But I noticed something. The ones closest to the field, about a hundred plus of them, cornering the field, cornering the field, had their backs to the field, closest to the game, unable to see it. Why? They were looking out for depravity in the stands. And then on the field were these uniformed men looking for depravity among the players, just in case one preferred shoulder stick while the game was going on. You didn't get that because you were doing better things, I guess. 
one player was evicted for biting another player's shoulder and chewing him up on the shoulder. And his fans were thoroughly upset that he was evicted. You know, it's not just sports. It's not just soccer. Government, politics, money, religion. Sooner or later you see the depravity of the human heart. It's not bread that you and I are missing. It's something far more serious than that. The problem is not intellectual. The problem is really moral. So comes the second temptation. The second temptation is, why don't you jump? Because he promised that he will give his angels to keep charge over you. And Jesus says, be gone. It is also written, you shall not test the Lord your God. Pardon this little story. He heard of this boy who wanted a bicycle, so he didn't know how to pray. So he started watching Christian television programming, and he watched a high church service, and he got down on his knees that night and had written down the prayer, and he said, Almighty and eternal God, if it is in your sovereign will that I have a bicycle, I will be eternally grateful if you will provide it for me world without end. Amen. He woke up the next morning, there was no bicycle, so he switched channels and he learned another prayer. That night he went to his knees and he said, Dear Jesus, I declare my need for a bicycle and I state that it should be silver and blue and be here by six o'clock tomorrow morning. He got up at six, went to see there was no bicycle. He was dismayed. His mother was watching him and he walked around the house and found a statue of Mary and put that statue under his arm and disappeared into the woods. He came back about 10 minutes later without the statue. She followed him. He goes by his bedside and kneels and says, Dear Jesus, if you want to see your mother again. Have you ever wondered if a total stranger walked into an average church service knowing nothing about the gospel, what they would conclude about our God by the way we behave and the prayers we pray? Many of them would think God is like this slot machine. You pump in the right coins and you get out the precise answer. And there are time and time again where you don't get that precise answer. And your soul sort of struggles and struggles and struggles. Jesus says this to the enemy of our souls. He says, be gone. He says, you know, you shall not test. You're not going to tempt the Lord your God. You're not going to make your entire belief system on getting what you want at that precise moment how difficult this is in your journey of faith and mine. How hard this is when you kneel by the side of a sick child and we want immediately to see that prayer answered. Which of us has not gone through that? Which of us has not gone through moments where we've desperately wanted that prayer to be answered? I have just finished a manuscript along with one of my colleagues from Oxford Vince Vitale, the book is called Why Suffering? Why Suffering? Where suffering is the intimation of something broken, something wrong in the physical world. Why do we put it into the moral context of how can an all-powerful and an all-loving God allow suffering? That's, that's what they call the trilemma. God is all-powerful. God is all-loving. Yet there is evil, that trilemma. And we've responded to that trilemma in this book and responded to it both from the point of the, of the intellect and the point of view of emotion and experience. But the problem does remain many, many times in our personal experience as we say, why not? And Jesus says, don't test him. You see, today it may be problem A and he answers it for you. Tomorrow it may become problem B third date may be problem C and you very quickly find out you're really not trusting God you are playing God what would have happened 
if Jesus had yielded to this temptation and Satan knew why he was zeroing in on this particular temptation. And that's why the gospel writer says he, is, he went away for a season. He was going to return to him when he was on the cross. If Jesus had buckled down and yielded here, there would be no gospel story. Love, the most beautiful thing in the world that you and I look for is love. I mean, you've heard the joke, haven't you? What do you get when you get a country music song playing backwards? Well, you get your pickup truck back, you get your house back, you get this back, you get that back. All of country music is on love and it's on romance. My wife and I have been married for 47 years. Yeah. I know I don't look it, I just look 25 or something like that. But you know what? I'll never forget the day I met her. She was 16 and I was 20. I just come from India, she was from Canada. And when I looked at her, I wasn't listening much to the sermon that day. I was looking at her across and I thought, that's the one I want to meet. And strangely enough, she thought the same thing. And now, after 47 years, in fact, coming up in two, three months, will be 48, as Margie and I have been wed. I want to tell you two things about love. It's hard work. It's hard work. You see, when you put the ring on that finger, it is a tourniquet to stop your circulation. <laughs> when you say yes to her, you're really saying no to everyone else. Do you realize it's the greatest compliment you pay a human being when you take them at their word when they say, I do? Do you realize that? Young people, let me tell you something. G.K. Chesterton put it this way, free love is a black and white contradiction in two words. Love was never intended to be free. It is the nature of love to bind itself. It is the nature of love to bind itself and the consummate expression is the most sacred expression of all physically which actually represents the spiritual consummation of two people saying I do. C.S. Lewis says there are four kinds of love agape love the love of God storge love parental love which is protection phileo which is brotherly love or friendship love, eros, which is romantic love. Agape, storge, phileo, eros. And the other three have no point of reference without the first. They have no point of reference without the first. You cannot really define love until you understand the one who has created you and me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You cannot love without giving. And God gave to us the most precious gift of all in his Son. Love cannot be defined apart from God. And if our culture is messed up. It's messed up right here. We have no longer a definition or a point of reference for love. You love your car, you love your house, you love your dog, you love blue, you love uh, Italian food, you love Indian food, you love your wife. Same word. Not so for the Greeks. They had agape, storge, phileo, eros, and the last three hung on the peg of the first. And if you are living with a broken heart today, 
because of a broken love. You probably had that love broken because somebody didn't hang love on the peg of the eternal love of God himself. Then you understand that worship is coextensive with life. It is a moment by moment expression, not just in a punctiliar or a momentary sense. It takes you every moment. Have you seen the movie Chariots of Fire years ago? It's the true story of two runners, Harold Abrams, who ran for personal glory, Eric Little, the Scottish runner, who ran for the glory of God. In the early part of the movie, Harold Abrams is being asked by a friend, Montague, Harold Abrams, cocky, sure, confident, and Montague looks at him and says, I hate losing, Harold, how about you? He says, I don't know, I have never lost. Towards the end of the movie, Harold Abrams is being massaged before this great run of his, and I think it was the 1924 Olympics in Paris. And Harold Abrams is getting ready, and Montague's already run and already lost. And Eric Little had not run on his key event because the heats were going to be on the Lord's Day. He changed his event and was going to run in the 400 meters as a change so that he could live with his conviction, which he was not foisting on anyone else, but in his mind, he did not want to abuse the Lord's Day and he kept that as a firm principle. Earlier on, Harold Abrams and he had competed in the event. The movie doesn't show that and actually he beat Abrams in the event that they did ran, the 200 meters. They were pitting themselves against each other. But now Abrams is about to run the 100 meters. Little is not running in it. And Montague looks at him and he asks him if he's ready. You know what he says? He says, you know Montague, I used to be afraid to lose. But now I'm afraid to win because I have 10 seconds in which to prove the reason for my existence and even then I'm not sure I will. He ran the 100, he won it, went out in despondency, he'd reached the climactic goal of pleasure in his life, it ultimately let him down. He had nothing left to celebrate, there was a downer after even his victory. Little, his sister said to him, Eric, you're giving up so much. He says, why are you giving up so much for this? And he put his hands gently on her shoulders. He says, Jenny, 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 God has made me for a purpose, but he's also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. When he started to run the 400 meters, the American athlete Jackson Schultz walked over to him and gave him a piece of paper. And Eric opened it just before the gun was sounded and it said, Them that honor me will I also honor, says the Lord. Eric clasped that piece of paper and breasted that tape as a winner. Eric ran with his hands flailing, looking to the heavens, to him. Even his running was an expression of worship to God. Whatever you do, you may work in a computer, you may be a ditch digger, you may work in a cemetery, you may be the executive of a corporation, you may be a homemaker, you may be a student. Do all to the glory of God and give that as an expression of worship to Him. My father-in-law passed away a few years ago at the age of 85. And I remember sitting across the table from him and uh, he said, I'm afraid to die so soon, son, because I didn't have the time to provide enough for Mama. He was referring to his wife. I said, Dad, you have? He said, no, I haven't. I said, you have? He said, how do you know I have? I said, I've talked to your accountant. <laughs> for the first time, I saw my father-in-law stymied. I said, we've been looking into all of that, Dad. From diagnosis to death, it took him four months. He thought he had been moving some bookcases, pain in the back, turned out to be a tumor. Four months later, he was gone. I said, Dad, don't worry. And I said, I tell you what, even if you hadn't provided, we're there. Why are you worried about this? He said, he was a World War II veteran, you know, Royal Canadian Air Force. He said, son, it was my responsibility. I said, and if you feel you could not fulfill it, we will, because of our love for you. Don't be fearful. 
He went into a period of silence for a few days. I had gone to speak somewhere. His three of his four daughters were around him. And I thought I would make it back, but we'd all in some ways said our goodbyes, but I didn't want to be back. I missed it by about an hour. And his three daughters standing around him and his wife, and my wife said after these days of silence, he opened his eyes, he looked to the heavens, and he said, amazing. That's amazing. And then he looked at his wife of 63 years and said, Jean, I love you. What a way to say goodbye to this world. Coach Lou Little coached a young football player who never made it to the first string. He was always the second stringer. Little liked him, but he was not the best. Invariably, Little would tell in his story in his book, he would see this young man walking through the college grounds with his father's arm in his, showing him, the young lad was showing him around the buildings, but he was always describing something. He said, I felt I was intruding into that, so I never went to talk to them. He said, one day the young lad came to me and said, Coach, I'm not going to be here for tomorrow's game. I have to go for my father's funeral. He passed away. And the coach said, it's okay. We'll wait for you to come back. So he had to go for his father's funeral. He came back a few days later. He said, Coach, I've never asked you to do this. Please let me play next week's game. He said, I can't displace somebody who's playing better than you. He said, I agree. Give me just a few minutes on that field, and if I'm not that best player out there, you bench me. He said, okay. He put him out there. He played his heart out as one of the best players of that team. So that even the man he replaced said, you made the right decision, coach. You needed to play him. And as they were walking away, the coach put his arm around him and said, what got into you? Was this because of your father's passing? He said, but a little more than that. He said, coach, my dad was blind. Today is the first day he was going to see me play. I was invited to, uh, to Louisiana to uh, visit a prison. You may have heard me mention it on the air because it was so overwhelming. It is called the Angola Prison. There are over 5,000 prisoners, 5,300 prisoners in Angola Prison, 85% of whom are on life without parole. 45 of them on death row. It used to be the bloodiest prison in the country. Blood on the walls, blood on the ceiling, blood on the carpets, and this amply built man by the name of Burl Cain with the girth of a southern sheriff. He comes over and says, I'll take this job as warden if you let me do it my way. And they brought him on. He puts Bible verses all over the prison. He has Bible studies every day. He's got a degree program going on there for theology. 90 prisoners are now registered. Former gangsters, now they're gangs of pastors. When you, when you, used, when you used to check into Angola, they used to give you a knife to protect yourself. No more. You know what they told me? You can take the loveliest looking young woman and walk her past any one of the cells. You won't hear a profane word. You won't hear a cat call. You won't hear a whistle. Profanity is not allowed in this prison by either staff or inmate. It has become one of the safest prisons in the country. And as I walked past death row cell to cell shaking hands, some of them had my book, some of them had John Piper, some of them had R.C. Sproul's, and every one of them had a Bible in the cell. An experience I never had before, walked into the execution chamber. Pretty daunting, pretty daunting. In fact, I told the chaplain there, I said, I'd like to bring my whole team here, because I think you stare death at death in a way you never stare at anywhere else. And I sat at the table where they have their last meal before they're taken to be executed. And as I sat on that chair, I began to wonder what must go on through the emotions of a man. And I looked to the wall, it's a painting. It's a painting of Daniel in the lion's den on his knees. I said, who painted that? He said, one of the prisoners. He painted it to say, God can still rescue you. And I said, and what if he doesn't then? 
So look at the other wall. There's a picture of Elijah rising to the heavens on chariots of fire. If he doesn't rescue you this way, he'll rescue you that way. It's a story of a rich man with a lot of jewels and a lot of money in his pockets and he's taking a long journey. And as he is beginning this journey, a thief begins to follow him. And the thief has set his sight upon all of this, these goodies. And the story in India, in Hindi is called Dhan Tumare Paas Hai. I'll tell you what it means, but it says Dhan Tumare Paas Hai. And the thief is following this man. And the man knows what he's up to. So every time they check into a room, the thief checks into the same room. They spread out the mats, put out the pillows, and the rich man is sharp. He knows what this fellow is up to all the time. So what he says is this to the as soon as they check into the room in the inn, he says, why don't you go and get washed up for the night? And after you get washed up, use the tap and come back, then I'll go there. So the thief says, all right, knowing he'll have the time alone while the rich man is getting his nightly ablutions there. So the thief goes out and the rich man, as soon as the thief steps out, takes all of his precious stones and money and puts it under the pillow of the thief. <laughs> And then the thief comes back and the rich man goes to get washed up and the thief is rummaging through the bags of the rich man. He's rummaging under the pillow of the rich man. He's looking at every piece of garment the rich man has to see where he's hidden it and he can't find it. Night after night after night he's looked everywhere except under his own pillow with that uneasy head wondering what is this boy up to? And the last night as they're about to part the rich man looks at him and says, I know what you've been trying to do. He says, you know what your problem is? You didn't know a very simple truth in life. Dhan tumare paas hai. The wealth was nearer to you than you realized. He has made you for himself and your heart is restless until you finds its rest in him. Be yourself. Be what God has made you to be. Do you know the word individual comes from the Latin, that which cannot be divided. You present an individuality of different components that is unique to you. Your greatest pursuit and my greatest pursuit should be to find out what God wants us to be as individuals, not to try to be someone else. Please be yourself. Quit trying to yearn to imitate someone else. By the way, Al has got one of the finest critiques on Brian McLaren's uh, Generous Orthodoxy, which I have downloaded before and used. Uh, you must follow up on that. There's another angle of this which uh, I, I will address, and that is that these emergent churches are going to produce a generation of people who actually will not be able to handle the challenge of Islam and other major world religions. They will not be able to handle it. And uh, my wife and I were having dinner with a very notable gentleman, I shall leave unnamed, but he was, um, he says he communicates to more people across television than anybody else in the world at any, on any given day. And they, I won't say too much more, but we're sitting across the table and he said he'd just been talking to a Muslim scholar and came away quite impressed with the fact that he had not known that there was really not that much of difference between Islam and Christianity. So my wife and I were having dinner with him and my wife is very, very well controlled in her expressions and I thought she was going to choke at that moment. I had to just uh, turn over to her and calm her down. Uh, I said, uh, why did you say that? He said, well, you know, he talked about all the points of agreement we have and so on. I said, well, let's go from here. They don't believe we have the Bible, but the New Testament is lost. They don't believe Jesus is the Son of God. They don't believe he died on the cross. They don't believe he rose again from the dead. They don't believe he's coming again as king. Do you think there's a difference between what they believe and what we do? I said, they don't have the gospel. But you know, this is the problem. The Muslims have shown us up. We don't know what we believe. When they present their ideas to an average young Christian going to a, one, of the, one of these emergent churches, one of the most prominent of those churches draws about 20,000 on Sunday. You can read his book. In that entire book of having a better life now and best life now and so on, there is not one mention of the cross in it. There, there is no gospel there. And so, you know, along with all the other compromises, we're going to be shown up. 
And the whole idea of RC here, you can't show counterfeit if you do not know what the genuine is. And I think that's a big price we are going to pay very dearly as a result of this kind of lack.